so my discussion this afternoon will be about the findings that uh, the findings behind uh, the papers that were published by PID, by PIDs uh, late last year on digital platforms and e-commerce, particularly regulatory issues that are relevant to platforms in the Philippines or platforms which have operations uh, in the Philippines. So this focuses on various areas, fintech, uh, payments, consumer protection, etc., and data privacy. So the main goal of both papers is actually to provide guidance to government and policymakers when crafting policies and regulations that could affect uh, innovation as well as digital platforms in the country. So how is this, uh, how is this done? Well, uh, first we look at the national innovation policy of the Philippines, uh, which is stated in various laws as well as the constitution. And then we assess how uh, specific regulations enacted to further said policies actually fulfill the policy objective stated in uh, the law and the administrative regulations. Uh, thereafter, we will also analyze how these regulations as well as policies are uh, in fact aligned with international standards set by various intergovernmental organizations uh, as well as groups. So as mentioned, so in the Philippines, we look at the national innovation policy when analyzing regulations. So the aim of this law is to is for government to place innovation at the center of its developmental policies and actually uh, explicitly implement a whole of government approach to ensure policy coherence, uh, alignment of priorities, etc. And really, th uh, the goal is to uh, encourage coordination interaction among various stakeholders. So that's government, uh, the business sector, academe, uh, as well as the business entities or the platforms themselves in order to find out how regulations can work for innovation. And then uh, from a more zoomed out perspective, we uh, the papers looked at the standards set by the UN, uh, the OCTAD, specifically on how uh, developing countries uh, or at least developed countries can analyze their own innovation policies and find out how they can uh, implement reforms to be more supportive for platforms. So in like briefly, the UN suggests that each country implement a national strategy for innovation to, to ensure coherence. Uh, it also suggests that each country should adopt baseline e-commerce regulations that would be quote unquote friendlier for uh, platforms and innovation such as uh, regulation specific to consumer protection, data protection, intellectual property, cybercrime, particularly for transactions made through the use of ICTs uh, there. And then similarly, for data privacy, since uh, there was another paper focusing on data privacy, in terms of standards, we look at the OECD privacy guidelines, uh, which suggests that each country in order to uh, encourage development or innovation should set legal parameters for the processing of personal information. So that would include uh, implementing limits as to the collection and processing, ensuring that the processing of data is only done relevant to the stated purpose of each processor or controller, uh, that processors or that entities implement certain safeguards for data, and that accountability mechanisms be set to ensure that certain entities or persons are accountable uh, when it comes to ensuring the uh, enforcement of protection pr principles. Closer to home, we look at the APEC privacy framework uh, of the ASEAN, uh, of APEC, uh, which gives generally uh, general policy directives to instruct members to formulate domestic laws that would allow cross-border uh, transfer of data uh, and to implement, hopefully, intergovernmental cross-border rules across jurisdictions. Uh, relevant to this is the uh, APEC CBPR, or cross-border privacy rules, which is essentially a voluntary system, which members can opt into uh, in order to encourage greater cross-border transfer of uh, data. Uh, we also look at the WTO, uh, WTO recommendations, which recognizes that Although countries may implement measures to uphold privacy rights uh, and then gives as much leeway to, to each domestic country, uh, it says that each regulation or the regulations must not 
be implemented in such a way that it would act as trade barriers or it would encourage uh, discrimination across jurisdictions and thus lead to regulatory arbitrage. So in the paper, we did the survey of relevant Philippine regulations as mentioned, and we look at regulations affecting the, poly the following areas. So general policy on innovation, we look at regulations that uh, affect electronic transactions, uh, payments and movement of funds, consumer protection, data protection, cybercrime, investment policies, as well as intellectual property rights. So we go straight to uh, the findings. So these are the regulations that are actually like the bright, the bright spots of our regulatory ecosystem now in the Philippines that are actually uh, friendly or beneficial to digital platforms and, and regulations that encourage electronic transactions. So as mentioned, we do have uh, a recently passed law, the Philippine Innovation Act, which uh, mandates that government, that all agencies consider innovation when coming up with policies and ensure that uh, uh, policies encourage entrepreneurship, etc. Uh, we also have the Innovative Startup Act that recognizes that uh, necessary for inclusive growth is the development of uh, MSMEs uh, and making them competitive assisting them from incorporation to internationalization uh, through various ways. We also have various laws uh, seeking to uh, make doing business in the Philippines easier. So we have the Anti-Red Tape Act as well as the Ease of Doing Business Act. And then recently, the Corporation Code was revised in order to make it easier for uh, entrepreneurs and businesses in the Philippines to set up an entity with little to no capitalization and with uh, like one to two persons. We also have the national ID system, which uh, hopefully would make it easier for platforms to verify identity and therefore make uh, services, online services, more accessible to the entire population. Uh, aside from these laws, we also have various policy declarations from different agencies like the DTI, the DICT, uh, yeah, and the, the Board of Investment, where they set uh, administrative roadmap as well as guidelines for, uh, let's say, e-commerce and for the DICD, like a cybersecurity roadmap. Now, in terms of payments and movements of funds, uh, I think this is one of the brightest spots probably in our regulatory system. So the regulator here, the BSP, has been very proactive in issuing regulations and in implementing uh, various methods of regulations in order to encourage the growth of uh, business models that allow uh, cashless transactions and money service businesses. So uh, we have regulations, example, for remittance, foreign exchange, e-money, and I think we're one of the first countries to formally allow or formally regulate virtual currency exchanges, uh, now called virtual asset service providers. Uh, we also have a national QR code standard, which seeks to make uh, which seeks to integrate or make it easier for consumers to use payment systems of uh, various companies. And then there's also a rule for all entities that provide electronic payment and financial services that for them to provide that, they must commit to integrate with the uh, automated clearinghouse and thus again make it easier for people to transfer money in and out of various wallets or various bank accounts. So like we have Instapay, PesaNet, etc. And then uh, it's also interesting how the BSP can uh, also take a light touch approach when it comes to regulating quote unquote new business models uh, and sort of a parang wait and see approach in order to for them to better understand the business model. I think that's how it's happening now with the operator, the regulations for payment systems. Uh, instead of a licensing procedure, they just implemented uh, an online registration for uh, for all operators of payment systems. Uh, and the application time is fairly short for that. Uh, aside from the BSP, the DTI also has its own regulations for payments, uh, which allows for gift checks and gift credits. So there's no licensing requirement for that. Uh, and of course, the SEC comes in when your virtual assets or tokens take the form of securities. Now for consumer protection, uh, although our law, uh, our Consumer Act was enacted back in 1993, uh, these regulations have been updated uh, through the E-Commerce Act and the Cybercrime Prevention Act, which basically states that the regulations for consumer transactions 
uh, in the analog world would apply to consumer transactions in the digital space. And then the Cybercrime Prevention Act also makes it a, makes certain offenses or certain acts criminal, uh, imposing heavy penalties and thus disincentivizing uh, bad actors in in the digital space. The BSP also has specific consumer standards uh, for the providers of financial services. So, for example, providers must disclose uh, certain information or relevant information about their products. They must disclose how to make complaints, how to reach the regulator, etc. Now, in terms of uh, cybercrime, uh, as mentioned, we have uh, enacted or we have a Cybercrime Prevention Act in place which uh, defines certain offenses uh, certain offenses, and provides heavy penalties for that. Uh, in addition, the Cybercrime Prevention Act also, in, uh, also makes certain offenses that were existing before the law, uh, cybercrime, when these are done through the use of ICT devices. So for example, if you commit a staff through the use of computers, of devices, that's elevated into a cybercrime. Uh, thus carrying uh, heavier penalties similar to, let's say, falsification, forgery, etc. In terms of law enforcement as well, the Cybercrime Prevention Act empowers law enforcement agencies uh, by giving them more tools to enforce the law. So uh, recently, the Supreme, the Supreme Court issued the Rules on Cybercrime Warrants, which uh, gives law enforcement agencies and the courts uh, the ability to allow law enforcement to, let's say, uh, search and seize uh, data stored on ICT devices. Yes, and then it also gives an obligation or it also obligates uh, platform, platforms, service, provide, uh, service providers, etc., to store certain types of data like traffic data, subscriber data within their systems for a certain period of time before deleting them. So the idea is uh, if someone makes a complaint against a platform or against another user of a platform, law enforcement agencies uh, should be able to ask the platform or demand the platform to cooperate. Now, for intellectual property rights, so generally uh, our regime, our IP, IP regime is uh, pretty much uh in line with international standards so the country is a signatory to various treaties uh allowing local inventors and creators to protect their rights uh, even offshore so uh, as for software codes and other creative works uh, the inventors can protect this through copyright uh, other products and solutions may be protected through patents so there's a study by the gii uh, which is published by the uh, by Cornell, NCAD, and WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Office, which actually uh, gave the Philippines its highest rank, I think, last year, uh, its highest rank ever due to the increase in uh, the filings for utility models and patents. Uh, I think uh, based on the study, the rank just was just uh, pulled down a bit due to difficulties when it comes to complying with other regulations aside from IP. However, uh, the IPO has made it easier uh, in the past year uh, for inventors to file uh, protections for utility models, trademarks, etc. Now, for data privacy, the local law, the Data Privacy Act, provides a relatively broad scope of protection for personal information uh, processed in the Philippines, whether it be the information of uh, foreigners or Filipino citizens. And then the law also extends the coverage of the protection to processing activities done offshore outside of the country, as long as the processing involves a Philippine citizen and a Philippine resident. Of course, there are certain exceptions, uh, but the baseline general rule is that all processing of personal information, whether this is done by a big company, a small company, so your Sari Sari store, or your uh, individual professionals, these are all covered by the law. So this is very different from the privacy regulations, let's say, in the United States, which uh, which only applies to certain entities uh, that reach a certain income. Now, generally for, so processing, when we say processing, that includes collection, storage, sorting, sharing, etc. Uh, generally, 
for any person slash entity to process personal info, uh, the there must be legal basis. And for platforms, for platforms, the most prudent way is to get consent, to get the consent of the data subject. Now, when we say consent, it's not just merely getting a yes. Uh, the platform must provide the following information. So the description of the personal info that you collect, how you process it, who you can share it to, uh, whether you implement certain automation uh, mechanisms. You also must inform the data subject about his or her rights, which is enumerated in the law, uh, as well as the period for processing and any uh, policy when it comes to deletion, etc. Now, in terms of accountability, so who has to comply? Uh, it has to be the personal information controller. When we say controller, that's the entity entity that decides what to do with the data. So in the context of digital platforms, that would be the platforms themselves. Uh, unless, of course, they are merely subcontractors for another entity. So in all cases, the controller is responsible for getting consent for ensuring that and for ensuring that the data privacy rights of the data subjects are respected. Uh, so if let's say a controller shares the data to a subcontractor, let's say an, uh, a marketplace platform shares the data to a logistics uh, entity, if there's a breach with the logistics entity, the accountable party would still be the uh, online marketplace. So that's the basic rule. So even you can share it offshore, but the controller would be liable for that data. So that makes it easy for data subjects to uh, to seek redress against uh, when it comes to data privacy violations. So it's important to note that the law actually makes it criminal uh, when a controller or when a person processes personal information without authority or if it conceals any security breach, uh, etc. So again, this is unlike other data privacy regulations abroad, uh, wherein violations are mostly just uh, met with civil penalties like fines or administrative sanctions. So again, when it comes to cross-border transfers, naman, uh, there is no prohibition in our law uh, against offshore transfers. The only requirement again is that generally the data subject must be informed about the fact of transfer since transfer is still processing. And then if you, again, if you transfer it to a subcontractor or whatever, the standards for outsourcing or data sharing as provided in the law and the regulations uh, must, be must be followed. So if you're the controller, you must make sure contractually uh, or technically that your subcontractors are compliant with Philippine law. So that in the event of an audit or a complaint, you can demonstrate that uh, you and your subcontractors are actually compliant with the law. So that takes... Uh, that would entail certain resources. And also, uh, this is also without prejudice to the application of other regulations. So for example, the BSP, the DOLE, as well as the BAR, uh, in case they do an audit, if your data is located offshore, they, those data, like those storage facilities, uh, whether it's been in the cloud or on-premise, must be auditable to the regulators. So what's the effect of so data privacy? Uh, the existing regulations actually build trust with regulators and consumers since data subjects are given more transparency and more control over how their data should be. Well, theoretically, they're given more control over how their uh, data could be processed and they can make uh, demands for, let's say, correction or for withdrawal, uh, et cetera. Now, in terms of uh, risks uh, or the gaps in our regulations, so we've, we've identified several uh, issues. Number one, when it comes to contracting, although our regulations uh, recognize that analog contracts and electronic contracts are the same or are equivalent, there are certain uh, kinks. So for example, if you want a document notarized, there is currently no way to completely remotely notarize it. Uh, you can notarize it electronically, meaning you do it via video conference. But the document itself, the physical document, would have to be uh, passed to the notary public and then back to you, etc. And then for uh, telco, telcos, uh, 
uh, if you look at our telco regulations, the way that the regulations on uh, public telco companies and value-added service providers, VAS providers, the way that uh, these are written, it seems to cover or it actually covers uh, providers of products, software products that provide content or advertisements or provides ways to communicate. So if you read that definition, uh, technically most platforms and most like mobile applications and software solutions are actually uh, VAS providers and that requires uh, that requires registration with the NPC prior to actual operation. And aside from that, uh, VAS providers are generally treated as public utilities and therefore subject to uh, the foreign equity restrictions, which is 6040 for public utilities. Now, for investments, uh, for investments, uh, we've identified certain uh, restrictions that are found in our constitution as well as our as various laws that would actually apply to digital platforms. So these are the restrictions on mass media, advertising, retail, uh, public utilities, and education. Now, uh, I think most relevant here would be uh, on mass media. So the restrictions for, for mass media that's found under our constitution, it says that only Filipinos and entities that are 100% owned by Filipinos can engage in mass media. Now, what mass media is, is not defined in the constitution. It's defined in various laws. So the Consumer Act, it says that mass media is uh, any activity that involves the communication of advertisements to the public through the use of TV, radio, uh, and newspapers. And then uh, the Tobacco Regulation Act back in 2003 extended this to include uh, advertisement communicated through internet, through the internet. Now, uh, that's fine. However, since the early 2000s up to 2018, there has been uh, various issuances from uh, the, the SEC and the DOJ defining mass media. And the opinions have been formulated such that internet platforms and internet businesses have been characterized as mass media. So for example, a an online platform that provides information regarding vouchers uh, was was declared to be mass media. Uh, another entity that provides technology that could be used by 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 customers to communicate uh, to communicate messages, uh, even though that entity did not create the message, uh, has been declared to be engaged in mass media. So various pronouncements such such as such as those uh, have basically uh, set up a rule wherein if you're an internet business communicating any message to the public whether or not you're the author whether or not you're the author of those messages uh is, uh, is mass media the subject to the to the foreign equity restriction of 100 percent now if you take those rulings uh, any website any mobile app uh, could be classified as mass media although uh, interestingly back in 2018 uh, back in 2018, the SEC, I think, slowed down a bit with those series of opinions uh, when a platform asked for an opinion whether uh, their platform, which allows financial institutions to display products on the site, whether or not it's mass media, the SEC did not make a uh, pronouncement. Instead, they gave certain guidelines. Uh, like, for example, uh, ads should not be... Uh, ads should not be prominently displayed, uh, information should be limited to the services of the platform, etc. Now, uh, that's a, a good turn by the regulator. However, that would still make all websites that publish ads, which I think most websites do, uh, as mass media. And uh, this would limit the ability of uh, platforms to obviously get funding. So, so I think mass media out of all four is the most controversial right now. Uh, for advertising, that's 70 30%. Uh, 70% should be 70% Filipino, and it covers entities that uh, are involved in the creation of messages or the conceptualizing of, uh, of ads, uh, not the publication, not the publication. Once you publish your mass media. Now, for retail, uh, I won't discuss this too much since uh, I believe there's, a, there's an ongoing bill. Seeking, seeking to liberalize uh, liberalize retail. Uh, 
So what I can say here is that right now, retail is technically liberalized. However, the threshold that one should meet, that a foreign retailer should meet before it can do retail in the Philippines is quite high. So it's $2.5 million. Uh, plus, it must have five re five exist it must have a retail experience of five years uh, all over the world. So those are some of the uh, requirements, which if you th uh, think about it, are not really applicable to retailers that are purely digital, since uh, most retailers would not have existed, at, at least right now, would not have a fi five year history and might not have uh, branches, which is one, one more requirement, you must have branches. Uh, for public utility, this is relevant only because uh, the definition of public utility extends to tech enablers, uh, such as uh, ride sharing platforms, uh, which right now uh, they're required to be 6040. And then for education, uh, if you read the definition, like education and public utility, the restrictions are provided under the constitution, but the definitions are provided in the law. So for education, it covers uh, formal education as well as technical and vocational courses. And if you read the definitions, uh, it would technically cover platforms that provide training online. Uh, although there is uh, right now an exception in the 18th and uh, the 11th negative list uh, where the president said that uh, education platforms or entities that provide short-term and high-level skills training are not part of the uh, are not part of the education system. Uh, however, right now there's still no clarity as to what constitutes short-term and high-level skills. So uh, we're not sure if, like, for example, entities like Coursera, etc., are covered by the restriction. Now, aside from aside from those issues, uh, another regulatory gap would be the existence of regulatory overlaps when it comes to the regulation of certain products or services. Uh, now, of course, the nature of tech products is that eventually they end up uh, providing various services, right? For example, it may be providing you with payment services, logistic services, information services, etc. So necessarily, uh, it may fall under the jurisdiction of two or more regulators. So for example, uh, we've mentioned a while ago, virtual assets, uh, or virtual tokens, uh, if these are uh, virtual assets under the definition of the BSP, then you're regulated by the BSP. However, uh, the DTI also regulates gift checks, which is like the virtual representation of value which you can redeem to purchase products and services from stores uh, there. And then once it takes the form of securities, uh, it, uh, it goes under the jurisdiction of the SEC. So I think the, the distinction between a virtual asset that's not a security and a security uh, is quite, uh, it's not that big. We have guidance under the law. However, if you're an issuer of a virtual asset, uh, there has to be some more clarity as to the steps that you would take in order to determine whether you should go to the BSP or you should go to the SEC uh, to avoid any situation wherein, let's say, one regulator has already cleared you uh, but while you're already implementing your business, another regulator might come after you. So same thing with the transportation sector. Uh, this is interesting because uh, public transport in the Philippines is uh, regulated by the LTFRB. However, if you read the rules, they only regulate uh, four-wheeled vehicles uh, and not two-wheeled vehicles and not three-wheeled vehicles. So if, for example, if you're a tricycle, you don't actually go to the LTFRB, you go to the LGU. And then if you're, a, let's say, a motor motorcycle taxi, right now it's uh, there's a gap in the law. You're technically not regulated by anyone. So aside from overlaps, there's also uh, the problem of regulatory divergence when it comes to data privacy. Since uh, although the Philippines uh, allows the allows uh, cross-border transfers. Uh, technically, if you, let's say you're a controller in the Philippines, you transfer data to Malaysia or in Indonesia, uh, under Philippine law, you're required to comply with Philippine law. However, uh, there are instances where you will also be required to comply with the minimum requirements in 
the destination country like Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, etc. And uh, the thing is, the regulations either are divergent. The basis for legal the legal processing of data differs from one country or uh, to another. So some jurisdictions, uh, the basis for legal legal processing is consent, uh, so that you can transfer one data from here to there, or from their jurisdiction to to wherever. Uh, in some jurisdictions, aside from consent, the destination country must also be part of some uh, whitelist issued by the regulator. So if you're a platform, you must do some some level of due diligence to identify what regulations actually apply to you. And of course, to engage uh, the services of a lawyer or, or compliance services in the jurisdictions where you operate. Now, uh, I mentioned that there's an APEC cross-border uh, privacy rules in place right now. However, uh, as of the moment, only two parties actually opted in, and that's uh, the Philippines and Singapore. Uh, the other countries uh, have not signified any intention yet to join. So that's one issue that we have, uh, that digital platforms have to work with. Uh, if they wish to have cross-border operations or if they want to expand regionally. No. Uh, in terms of the effects on platforms, uh, for data privacy, uh, we'll tackle this first. Uh, obviously, due to the requirements of our local privacy regulations, uh, there will be an increase in the operational and compliance cost of the digital platform, uh, which is necessary for them to be able to comply with the transparency and aut uh, autonomy requirements of the law. Uh, again, uh, the data subject must be informed about everything that happens to their personal info, which requires granular processing audits by the digital platform, which is a good thing because, again, uh, platforms are forced to rationalize the way that they process data, uh, are forced to conduct privacy impact assessments, and hire a data protection team. Uh, but then that comes with, with cost. And uh, as mentioned, the divergent regulations across the region uh, could act as a non-tariff trade barrier uh, between countries uh, due to the compliance costs required of comply required if you want to comply with uh, the all jurisdictions, the regulations from all jurisdictions. Uh, and now you're forced to decide if you're a platform whether you want to have any activity in a country that may uh, impose higher or more burdensome regulations as opposed to another country with lower regulations. Uh, yeah. As to the effects on data subjects, uh, it's, it can be argued that the Data Privacy Act and privacy regulations, uh, although it, it empowers individual data subjects by giving them more information about their data, uh, given that ours is consent-based, this would, in order to comply with the data, you just need to have, well, you hire a lawyer or a compliance team, and a platform can end up having very long consent forms and privacy policies. Uh, however, whether the policies are actually read by the data subject is another question. So it might give uh, some false sense of control over the data. And I think uh, cog cognit cognitively, uh, it may be unreasonable to expect a data subject, uh, a layman, a normal consumer, to actually uh, understand the language of consent forms and to make a an informed decision at the moment that those consent forms are forwarded to them which is when they need the service. That's one thing. Now, so uh, impact. Uh, so the regulations, the regulations that we have are those, the gaps that we identified uh, may have some impact on the ability of platforms to raise funding or to get funding, uh, especially in the context of the Philippines and ASEAN. So uh, for platforms that want to compete with global startups that have already enjoyed first mover benefits, as well as the network effects of uh, digital platforms, uh, these local startups would have to take advantage of uh, setting some market differentiation or developing new products, which would definitely entail or require extensive capital, uh, extensive capital from, from these local startups. Now, uh, with the difficulties or the uncertainties presented by 
what we've discussed in the previous slide, like investment restrictions, regulatory overlaps, etc. cetera. Uh, these may be a disincentive for startups to either uh, locate here or have operations in the Philippines. Now, uh, various studies by the ASEAN, the UN, OECD, as well as uh, private entities like Google and Temasek uh, revealed that funding problem is definitely a regional phenomenon across ASEAN. But if you compare the ASEAN countries, the Philippines is still uh, performing worse uh, compared to other countries in the region in terms of the size of the M&A deals that are happening locally as well as the number of M&A deals. So just to give you an idea, uh, there. So in Google study, the Philippines actually ranks behind Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, in terms of the deal size and the number of M&A deals. So this is from a 2019 uh, study. Now, aside from funding, uh, the compliance issues may also be a disincentive for uh, compliance-driven platforms and would affect their ability or their desire to roll out products uh, in the country. So to cite as an example, uh, not, not close to home. So for example, uh, Amazon's experience in the United States, uh, when it launched its drone research, it did this in the UK due to uh, what was cited before was the uh, very strict requirements in the US uh, before one can get a permit to fly drones or to get a permit to conduct drone research. So all of their operations were transferred in the UK. They eventually transferred it back when the US relaxed its regulations when it comes to drone operations. Uh, in the Philippines, we saw how this worked uh, with, uh, with CESA, although probably it happened, uh, it, it's, uh, no, it's the other way around. So CESA back in 2016, 2017, issued regulations allowing virtual currency exchange uh, offshore virtual currency exchanges to operate in CESA. Uh, and they, the CESA provided a licensing, like licensing rules for them. And then uh, eventually uh, several, several offshore companies decided to set up in CESA, even paying the relatively high uh, cost for the licensing, uh, for the license as well as the investment requirements. And I think that shows that if the regulations are clear, uh, platforms are willing to subject themselves to regulations uh, since they can treat this as a uh, as a, some sort of market, like a marketing strategy uh, where they can say that they are compliant, uh, they have a government agency auditing them or looking after their operations. Uh, in a negative Linaman, uh, we see how this affected the rise or the growth of ride hailing services in uh, the ASEAN. So, for example, in Malaysia and Indonesia, they had problems, Gojek had problems launching their services in both countries due to the absence of regulations actually allowing motorcycle taxis. Uh, but eventually, uh, once the regulator decided to, to formulate regulations allowing for these services, uh, those regulations eventually, or those services eventually uh, took root and then grew and eventually expanded regionally. Now, uh, another effect of the regulatory gaps we identified is how it leads to regulatory uh, arbitrage. So this happens when uh, entities, uh, due to the regulatory risk and uncertainty in one jurisdiction, let's say the Philippines, uh, are encouraged to locate in other areas or jurisdictions where risk is more manageable. Or uh, other than that, it also refers to instances where uh, a platform could redefine its activities or its structure in order to take advantage of less stringent regulations within a single jurisdiction. Okay. Now, to illustrate how this happens, uh, for cross-border regulatory arbitrage, like, right? So we've identified three main uh, three main trends. So first, absolute relocation. This happens when a Philippine-based platform 
decides to locate and operate in an offshore jurisdiction completely and basically leaves its leaves the Philippines. It has no it no longer has any ties here. It has no operations here. Uh, and they may be driven by, uh, by, by the desire to operate in a more friend, in a friendlier, uh, friendlier jurisdiction where uh, compliance is, where regulations are more certain. So another, another trend would be hub relocation. And this happens when a platform relocates its head office in a preferred jurisdiction, but maintains presence in the Philippines in order maybe to take advantage of certain regulations that could be favorable to them. So an example here would be, let's say, uh, a digital platform transfers to Singapore in order to enjoy the lower tax rates there and in order to enjoy uh, yeah, the lower tax rates there and maybe uh, regulations that could legalize or formally legalize its operations. However, uh, these platforms may still uh, retain limited operations in the Philippines, mostly for, uh, let's say, development work, uh, support services, back office operations, uh, tech support, etc. cetera. Uh, due to the fact that uh, wages or salaries may be lower in the Philippines uh, and they don't need to compromise on uh, the skill level of workers. So uh, this is okay. However, one effect of this is the entities which are retained in the Philippines are limited to providing services to the principal company offshore. So it's questionable whether uh, such activities actually contribute to uh, innovation in the country since these entities don't engage in, let's say, product development, uh, etc. Now, the third one, uh, which is the most, uh, the most, uh, the trend that could be most harmful to the Philippines is when fictional relocation happens, uh, which is when a platform does not decides not to organize in the Philippines at all. It doesn't register a business here, uh, an entity here, and still does business in the country. So uh, an example here would be, let's say, a social media platform operating purely offshore. It has no presence in the Philippines. However, uh, consumers and users in the country can still choose to avail of the services of that platform uh, and let's say buy features, uh, buy goods and services, uh, thus allowing an entity not organized in the Philippines or not paying taxes in the Philippines to still enjoy uh, our market and enjoy revenue here. Now, aside from uh, those instances which uh, involve some cross-border elements, Regulatory arbitrage could also happen within the Philippines uh, due to certain regulatory gaps. So this happens when uh, uh, this happens when platforms uh, take advantage of certain gaps. Let's say if you're a virtual asset provider which allows payments, which where you allow people to use tokens for payments, you might characterize characterize yourself as a gift check instead of a virtual asset under the BSP rules in order to evade licensing requirements. Now, for we go to the policy considerations. <clears throat> now, uh, given all of given all of those, given what we've discussed, the paper suggests that the uh, following be undertaken. So regulators and policymakers should reevaluate re objectives behind restrictive policies and assess whether these regulations are aligned with the stated objectives. So for example, most of the investment restrictions we have uh, were actually written decades ago and may have to be reconsidered in light of the existing technology these days. And in light of the fact that the harms that ex existed long ago may not, not, uh, may not be uh, relevant today. And then uh, the paper also suggests that uh, regulators make use of regulatory intersections instead of doing away with it completely, since each regulator presumably has an expertise, uh, has its own expertise, and redund redundancies could create regulatory safety nets. Uh, the goal is to avoid duplication, which could be uh, wasteful. Yeah, and then uh, the paper also suggests that. The regular assessment and reassessment of regulatory intervention should be continuously studied 
uh, in order for policymakers to uh, determine what type of approach to take in order to address a specific uh, issue posed by regulatory uh, gaps. So in some cases, it may be better for regulators to take a wait and see approach in cases where, for example, they want to study the technology, but they don't want to hinder the innovation that could happen. Uh, in some instances, it may make sense to take preemptive actions against uh, innovation that could potentially be harmful to the public. Uh, in some instances, it may make sense to take a light touch approach where regulators instead issue best practices or guidelines instead of uh, implementing uh, ex ante regulations. Now, for closing, uh, I think what the paper says basically is uh, regulatory frameworks definitely play a key role in driving digital platforms. Uh, and these must be re re evaluated uh, in order to make sure that these are aligned with the now country's own innovation policies as well as uh, policies sent by policy sent uh, issued by other intergovernmental organizations uh, which we are a party to aside from uh, looking solely domestically we may also need to look at uh, implementing or pushing for intergovernmental regulations or cooperation uh, for areas such as uh, data privacy I think that's it. Okay. Thank you.